and touch us all tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. We're turning our Bibles to Psalms 37. Psalms 37. And we'll read verses 1, 2, and 3. Say, so you've heard good preaching tonight. Praise the Lord. And how wonderfully the Lord is working with the young people. And Bob wasn't kidding, you know, when he said about, uh, we don't want to wait for the president and all to sign it. He means uh, the President Bush. This is such a high honor in uh, Royal Rangers that it's even signed by the president. So this is no small thing that the two Michaels have accomplished here. Praise the Lord. All right, Psalms 37, verses 1, 2, and 3. And here we go. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Now, this is going to be one of the big things of our day. It's going to be one of the major problems is fretting. Satan does not like to be ignored. It's one thing that Satan has a hard time with is to be ignored. And as he rises up and causes people to do horrid things. I mean, weird. How many know there's weird things going on today? Weird things. Things that you never heard of before. In the way of sin and perversion and cannibalism and all these things. You know, this is unusual. And the reason that it's coming up like it is is because when something like that happens, it appears in the television and the newspaper and it's carried into other people by the power of suggestion. And that's what's happening. Uh, if you'll notice now, the latest school student to be arrested with a pistol was an, eight, an eighth grader. He shot one student in the chest. When I read it, he, the boy was in serious condition. But this boy was carrying a 357, which is a very heavy, a very powerful weapon, a very powerful weapon. And an, and an eighth grader carrying a 357 into a classroom and shooting one boy around, waving this pistol around till some of the teachers talked him to lay the thing down. An eighth grader. Well, he should be running about 10, 5, 6, and 8. He should be about 13 years old. He should be about 13 years old. Well, you see, the reason he did that is because he's reading that in the paper. That's what just happened in Texas. And before that, it just happened in another school. And then it happened in another place. In the same way with the shootings with employees that get laid off. It's the power of suggestion. The press, the media is causing this problem. They're causing half the problems in the countries. <laughs> if they ever stop me on the street and poll me and ask me what the problem is, I'll say you. You're causing the problem. There must be a place for media, but... I don't know how you regulate it because it's, it's people. And then in the cannibalism, the, the people's minds are sick from the television. They, and they get that and they do it. Well, this is just the beginning. Now, what Satan wants is for us, as these things happen, riots, injustice, uh, the things that happen, he wants us thinking about that. And he can get as much mileage not only of the incident, but he gets more mileage of causing people to be thinking about these things, about the injustices, writing to the newspaper, giving their opinion, what should be done about this and that, and about the truck driver, and about the man that was beaten, and about the jury, and about that. He wants our minds on evil. And the commandment is, in Philippians, the commandment is, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, think on these things. He doesn't say it's a good idea. 
He says it's a commandment, and the Lord wants us to do that. That is difficult, especially when we see injustice. For example, I, I guess it's my generation, but one man during the riot was standing out in front of his store with a gun defending his store. And one of the, one of the uh, commentators said, there you go, vigilante justice. Well, vigilante justice, and the man standing out in front with a pistol guarding his store doesn't quite equate. But what God wants us to do is get off it. And I don't know whether that means quit looking at the television or quit reading the newspaper or what, but the commandment is whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, think on these things. That's not an opinion. That's a commandment in the New Testament. And there's a reason for it. There's a reason for it because we are called to offer praise unto God. And we are called to be a witness and so that the people around us can see the Lord. And when our Adamic man goes into action and begins to judge and try to find some justice in this stuff, and there is not justice in it, then we lose out, and God knows we will lose out. We're not, we're not praising him. We are doing what the Bible says not to do. We are fretting. Now, God does not want us fretting about abortion. It, when we can do something about it, we are to do it. But otherwise, we are not to fret. When we can do something about injustice, we are to do it. But we are not to fret. Fretting leads to evil. Fretting is a tremendous problem in the day in which we live, and it's going to be worse. And I, I think we may have to get, certainly I hope nobody in here is watching the television. If you do, uh, you do. I can't stop you, but what you're seeing, I want you to know, is biased. You're not seeing the truth. You're seeing stations in which it's been demonstrated by resource research, that their values are not the value of the average American. It's skewed way off. Almost all of the media is biased in favor of abortion. They're biased in favor of the Arabs. And this has been tested by research. They, they do not. The media, including Hollywood, does not reflect the values of the average American. And when you're looking at this without realizing it, you know, you are doing what God said not to do. He said, be, uh, be tr transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, these things are not in there to be cute. They're deadly in their effect. And things are going to get much worse than they are. And maybe the things that have happened so far haven't shaken you. Well, the things that happen in the future will finally dawn on you, hey, something's going wrong. And when it does, remember, God said these words, do not fret because of evil men. That's a commandment. Do not fret because of evil men. It's our Adamic nature that is seeking justice. And it isn't, we're not going to find it in this world. So forget it. You're not going to find it until you die and go in the spirit realm or until the Lord comes, this world is going to get worse. God spoke to me about that the other day. And he said, the tares, the tares are going to come to maturity. Okay? It is necessary that offenses come. It is necessary. But woe unto them through whom they come. Because through these offenses, God is perfecting a remnant of people. As long as things are kind of okay, you will get no perfection of your remnant. You will get no purifying of the Christian church. It isn't going to happen. When things are okay, people figure, well, you know, I mean, things aren't the greatest. They're not like when I was a boy. I've been reading the most marvelous story. I better not get off. I don't get on to anything else. But it's an old, quaint, story about a bookseller, and I just said, Audrey, here is a man 
here's a man. It's a bookseller. So in love with books. He made a packing case for a doghouse, and then in the back, he painted the, like the backs of books, the spines of books, so it looked like the dog had rows of books in there. And he made up titles, uh, like he had one, uh, The Rubiat of Omar Canine, and then he had uh, 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 a, a book on dogma. And then he, yeah, and then he had another title by an author named Bone, and uh, uh, B O H N, and so on and on. Well, this, I love it. This is the only stuff that keeps me sane. And of, a, of, of an evening, he and this hound dog of his, they'd sit down by the fire and he read Shakespeare to the dog. Now, that may not mean much to you. I mean, but to me, I said to Audrey, I've got to read that. This is keeping me sane. I can't mentally, I can't comprehend what's happening in the world. I can't comprehend. And a man that reads Shakespeare to his dog, that I understand. But the stuff that goes on in the world, I can't understand. It's going to get worse. You see, Americans, we're all trying to flee back. Now they've got one of the TV shows. I forget the name. It was one of the family shows, and they're making an institution out of it. They've got to have reruns and reruns, and these are adults that are doing this. Because we can't stand, we, we, we want to go back to another age when things, you know, when two men had a fight and then they got up, shook hands, and went home. Not when they flew into a satanic rage and stabbed each other. You know, I'm a man of two generations, so I can see. We long for that. And we keep thinking, well, maybe it isn't so bad. People, it's going to get worse. Things are changing. Things are actually changing. And God is changing us and giving us a militancy and strength and music and doctrine that we haven't had before so that we can be more than conquerors through Jesus. And one of the great lessons is the mind because Satan is going to try to get us to concentrate on by voting or by protesting or something to keep combating the evil. That's not going to work. And we've got to, as I say, when good comes to our hand to do, yes. But otherwise, God wants us not to fret, but to look up. Because evil men and seducers are what? They're going to grow worse and worse, deceiving, and being deceived, it's going to happen, people. Nothing's going to stop it. And if we spend our time fighting that, which is exactly what Satan wants, we'll miss out on what God wants, which is for us to have a happy heart. So when he looks down, there we are saying, oh, Lord, I love you, not, oh, God, look at that thing. Oh, what they did. That's unjust. That's, can't they see that? That's perverse reasoning. That's not right, you know. What joy can God have in that? God wants us to sing and dance in the heights of Zion because we can't stop this thing. That's not our responsibility. Our responsibility is to shine in God's presence. Not to, we can't stop the tares from maturing. We can't stop this world on its hell-bent way. They have chosen sin, but God will give us a place where we can bear witness and where we can help some. If we're not fretting, once we begin to fret and rage and take sides against race or against uh, social status or something else, we're no good to the gospel. God loves everybody. God loves all those people in L.A. He like created all of them and he loves all of them. The cops, the blacks, the Latinos, the Orientals, God loves them all. I don't even believe that. And we don't do a bit of good when we take sides and that's what we do when we begin to read of the injustice and fret. We begin to take sides. And these, are, these problems in, in Los Angeles are just like the problems in our home. They're so complex. They're so complicated that you can't make a judgment. I mean, how can you make a judgment? Because there's so much involved that only the principles know, and that's the way it is in Los Angeles. We, we're not able to judge. God would have us pray. God would have us pray. How many believe that? God would have us pray that God will reach out and touch many of those young men 
If he doesn't, they're going to end up in prison. Just as sure as a whirl. And what does that accomplish? Nothing. But they could be fruit for the master's table if we refuse to fret and if we pray. God's going to get some fruit for his table. Man, there have been motorcycle hellions and everything else that have been saved and become witnesses for God. God can reach out and touch anybody, a murderer, a rapist, anything, and turn him completely around and make him a witness for God. It's happened. He's the only one who can do it. And he wants us to always be in the place where our mind is pure and free and our heart is clear and we're not fretting so that when he would have us speak the word or pray or just to praise him and that frees him then to move down in the hell in which we're living and pull out some of these souls that need to be redeemed. We've got to keep ourselves above this thing, people. And if we fret, we're going to go down. Do not fret because of evil men or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. We look and we think, how do they get away with that stuff? God says, whoop, whoop, forget it. Forget it. You know, they destroy widows. They've got their savings and some saving alone. And some guy that ran the thing on the rocks gets off free with three or four million dollars and goes over and lives in Paris somewhere. How can this be? And you left some old couple penniless. God's a backup. They'll soon be cut down. They're going nowhere. All they're doing is collecting money to give to the righteous. That's what the Bible says. God is not forgetting or ignorant. He's in control. How many know God is in control? He's in control. And if we just keep our eyes on him, we're going to be all right. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Then it says in verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. You know, when we're fretting, we don't do good. We just tear down ourselves, we tear down everybody around us. Trust in the Lord and do good. Whatever your hand finds to do, just keep on patiently, meekly doing good as you have the opportunity. But what about what happened in L.A.? What about what happened in San Francisco? Trust in the Lord and do good. Leave those things with God. There's nothing you can do about it. If it's, you do something about it, do it. But most of us, there's nothing we can do about it. We don't know who we're voting for. We say, we'll vote for President Bush. This will happen. How do we know? We vote for Mr. Pro. This will happen. How do we know? We don't know anything. Well, I like what one black lady said up in L.A. She says, I don't even vote anymore. She says, That's what she said in the paper. I don't even vote anymore. I just trust God. She's got a point. I tell you, that lady's got a point. She's not trying to figure it out. She just trusts God. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Well, Brother Tom, you don't know what's going on in my life. No, I don't know. You don't know what's going on in my life either. <laughs> Man, I know this green pasture is there. It takes a little patience. We'll get there. God says green pastures. He means green pastures. Keep them in mind. They're coming. They're coming. Don't bite on this stuff. When Satan gets all his antics, starts banging on his pots and pans, don't bite on it. God has promised us green pastures, green pastures we're going to have. It'll come if we trust the Lord and do good. It'll come. And it says, enjoy safe pasture. I mean, there was so much pressure on me a couple of weeks ago. I, I looked at somebody who was laughing. It was outside of a restaurant. And I said, daughter, what's wrong with them? I mean, I couldn't even conceive of anybody laughing. My head, it felt like somebody was standing on it. I don't feel like that now. They're just things you go through. And it doesn't affect anything. And it's not significant. It's life. Oh, you just keep on going right up that mountain. Sometimes going straight up in the air. God, how in the world? <laughs> Keep on going. We're going to get there. Audrey was telling me today, driving home, you can't get out of the boat. <laughs> Why can't you get out of the boat? There's nothing around you but water. Sharks. <laughs> There's no land. Don't get out of the boat. 
There's nothing there. No. Delight yourself in the Lord. Now, you can't fret and delight yourself at the same time. You say, how do I do that? Everything's bananas in my life. Well, I got to admit, there's times when it takes a certain amount of discipline, but it's well worth working on. And I like what Stan said this morning. You know, we're all here. We've got more problems than Carter has liver pills. You know, it's like this. For the moment, you know, for the two hours we're here in the morning, forget it and let's praise the Lord. You know, that's good preaching. A lot of things were going to happen never happen anyway. And when they do, God gives us grace. And solutions come out of left field. And, and, you know, and then we forget to praise the Lord. But it's good preaching. You know, take some time during the day and say, well, Lord, I've got disaster behind me and disaster in front of me. But for the next half hour, I'm going to delight myself. <laughs> God knows what he's doing. He may look down and have pity on us. Yeah. Delight yourself in the Lord, and it says, and he will give you what? Now, yeah, I've heard people preach, and they say, God does not give you your desires. He gives you your needs. Because the Bible says, my God shall supply all your needs. Well, you know what we actually need is very little. What you actually need, if you were brought down to what you actually need, you could probably get by for 50 bucks a month. Yeah, if you were brought down to what you need, it's probably about 50 bucks a month. Now, maybe you can't get by in 2,500 a month, but that's the difference between what you need and what you think you need. But you know, that, that's the problem with getting too legalistic with the Bible. This one part says, my God shall supply all your needs. There's another part says, my God shall give you the desires of your heart. And you know, there's something about the desires of your heart. Most of us don't know what they are. Because we're so loaded with duty and fear and experience. And, you know, we've been beat down so much. You know, some fella in Congress said he started off, he wanted to save the world. And then he thought if he could save his section of the country. And he finally, later on in Congress, he thought, well, if I can save my state. And before he got retired from Congress, if he said, if I could just save the sand dunes in my city, I'd be, think I'd done something in the world. And I think we start off as kids and we think, you know, we're going to do some great thing. And, and life begins to deal with us. And before we die, we feel, well, I hope I didn't hurt anybody. Knocks the idealism out of us, doesn't it? His life just knocks the eye. I look at old people. I think, you know, one time that was somebody's little boy or somebody's little girl. What does life do to us? It beats us down, physically anyway, but it doesn't have to be spiritually. You know, God has said, I will give you the desires of your heart. And we ought never, never, never to let the Lord forget that. Lord, you said, and you know, and God, you take hold of God like that, you're going to get an answer. God will do what he said. But the trick is to find out what your desires are because most of us have got so many layers of varnish on us from different things that have happened that we can't get down to the wood. And so God sees that is not what you really want. You just think that's what you want. And he takes some of the varnish off. But you know, I know the desire of my heart. You think you do. There's still more varnish there, Charlie. And he begins to dig down. When we finally get down to the wood, God says, now I hear you. So let God frustrate you. Let God have his way. He's heard, but he didn't give me my desire in my heart. That's because God knew that it isn't what your desire was. That was a symbol or a metaphor of your desire. You thought that was your desire but it really wasn't your desire at all. He's getting down there. He's getting down there. And when he gets down to where you actually are after all this stuff, and in some cases, demonic pressure and possession and other things that warp our minds, when God, through circumstances, gets all of that out of us and gets us down to where we really are, he'll answer prayer. And thank God he doesn't answer it before then. <laughs> We'd be so messed up with what we thought we wanted and come to find out the shoes don't fit. 
Yeah, that was, you know, that was worth a lot of money, that right there. All right. Commit your way to the Lord. It's commit. It's God, I don't even understand what's going on. I only here don't understand what's going on in your life. Is there anybody beside me that does not understand what's happening to you? Talk about being poured from vessel to vessel. I don't even know myself anymore. I know what Paul meant. He said, I don't judge myself. I don't understand what in the world is happening to me. I'm glad to be alive for another day, but I'll be switched if I know how I got here. <laughs> Every once in a while, I look at the calendar. Now, what are we into? May 1992? I think, Maurice, how did I live so long? I can't understand it. I should have perished a long time ago. How I got here, I do not know. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him. As repeated. And he will do this. Here's a, here's a powerful verse, verse 6. Here's a powerful verse. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn and the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Do you ever get in the place where you're working out things with God and you know God is hearing you and you know your heart is right with God and you've made your covenant with God, and other people are judging you. Have you ever been there? Well, that's an interesting place to be. And there's no way, there's no way you're going to explain to them why you're okay in the sight of the Lord, because they're not going to believe it. And the more you talk, the more they're going to be sure that you're covering up something. You know the best thing to do is go to the Lord. And when our ways please the Lord, we're doing right in God's sight. Then God takes our position. God goes to bat for us. And he said, those that speak against you, I will condemn. For your righteousness of me is of me. And this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. Never have God give you that. Scripture. I'm sure he must have given to Paul many times. Paul, the apostle, was accused of so many things. One of them, I think, they were accusing him of tampering with money because he carried a big bundle of money around for the poor. You notice the way he protests. He says, I brought a brother with me and his brother so they could watch that offering, you know. Other things they were accusing Paul of. Paul says, I don't even judge myself. But I like, you know, if we just leave ourselves to, to the Lord, then people can say what they want to. They can make the case that they want to. It doesn't matter. Every tongue that shall rise against... And I'm talking about somebody that's talking to God and has made his peace with God. Every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Commit your way, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause, like the noonday sun. So we don't have to go running around to people saying you don't understand this, that, and the other. Leave it with God. Leave your case with God. Be still before the Lord. And wait patiently, patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways. I never told you the story of Achimaats and the Cushite. Well, I'm not going to do it tonight. Well, I'll tell you the highlight of it. Achimaats and the Cushite. You heard that story, did you? Well, Achimaaz was a kind of a favorite of David. And a man rebelled against David, the father of peace, Av Shalom. Rebelled against David, and he got caught between heaven and earth, which is where all self-seekers end up. They don't have their head in heaven. They don't have their feet on the earth. They just kind of hung in the middle. But out of that spun another story of self-aggrandizement, Achimaats and the Cushite. 
And David, uh, Joab, it, it, I mean, this, this Absalom must have been a big guy because it says Joab hit him with three javelins through the heart, and then Joab had ten armor bearers. You know, each one is carrying a different weapon, a different shield. So Joab said, give me my number nine iron, you know, or, you know, I'll take, I'll take my buckler this time and my dagger. And ten guys, and, and after three javelins in Absalom's heart, then the ten armor barons finished him off. He must have been a tough bird. Probably a big guy, too, because when his head was caught, he couldn't pull himself up. So he's probably pretty big and pretty heavy. But anyway, this is bad news for David because David was more concerned about his son, Absalom, than he was about all the rest of Israel. And Joab knew this, and Joab and the other men had heard David charge, be, be, be gentle with my son, be gentle with my son. And Joab had his own interpretation of that. So he tried to get another guy to finish him off, and the other fellow says, I heard what the king said, I'm not touching him. Joab says, get out of my way, you're wasting time. So Joab finished him off. But out of this came another story of self-seeking. This Achimaatz was a man that had helped David when David first fled, Achimaatz and Jonathan, known Natan. They were both the sons of priests, and they had acted as couriers for David. And so he's kind of a favorite of David. And he was known by his running. He had a very distinct style, uh, style of running. So Achimaatz, so uh, jo, somebody needed to run to David and tell him that the battle was won, David sided won, and Absalom was dead. So Achimaatz says, let me run, let me run. And uh, Joab says no, because he knew that Achimaatz was, a, was um, uh, a, a, a favorite of David, and he didn't want him to be the one to bring the bad news about Absalom. So he says, it's, you bring tidings another day, just forget it. So he turned to an Ethiopian man there. Now, this, this guy represents, he was a Cushite. Uh, the King James calls him Cushy or something. It's not right. The Hebrew is he was a Cushite. He was an Ethiopian a runner, a courier, and a very faithful man. A very faithful man was this Cushite. So he said to uh, Akimaatz, another day for you. This is not the day. This is evil tidings. He turned to the Ethiopian who had no connection with David, and he said, you send the message. Well, the Ethiopian takes off. He's a runner. Well, Akimaatz is standing there thinking, boy, this, I can, look at what I could be. I could be the one that brings the message. Look, look what I could do. Everything. And he says to Joab, please let me go. He says, why do you have no message? I've sent the run. Oh, but please let me go anyway. So Joab says, well, all right, you know, you're going to have your way. Well, here, here goes the mountains of Bashan. I mean, here goes Mr. Me, My, and Mine on his way. Well, he overtakes the Ethiopian, which is a marvel because Ethiopians are the best runners in the world. He overtakes this guy and passes it. And now I thought, how must this Cushite have felt? I mean, how must this guy have felt? Doing his job. And here comes Mr. Star. Oh, Lord. Don't fret, the Bible says, about men who succeed in their ways. Well, what happens? David's waiting there. Oh, Absalom, Absalom, my son, Absalom, my son, which is, shows us how all of us are selfish when it comes to our kids. I don't care if the rest of Israel dies, you know. Save me and mine. So the lookout, look at us. There's two men running there. There should have been one. Two men are running, wasting gas. And they said, and the guy out in front, that looks like Achimaatz. I mean, he's a famous runner. Here he comes steaming up, you know. He's so pooped out, he says, praise the king, falls on his face. He can't even get the message because he's exhausted. So the king says to him, how to go, how to go. All he want to know is he's my son, you know. So Absalom is what you call a positive preacher. Now he knew that Absalom was, he, 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 Achimaas knew that Absalom was dead. Because Joab said to him, this is a bad day. The king's son is dead. You shall, not you shall not run. He knew that Absalom was dead. He knew that. And so here he is on his face. <laughs> In the meanwhile, the guy with the message is coming up. 
And David says to, uh, how'd it go? How'd it go? How'd it go? He says, oh, you know, you've won and everything. And uh, may your enemies always be like what happened to them and everything. But how about Absalom? And you know this liar? He said, I don't know. There's a lot of people standing around here running here and there, and I don't know. How many know positive preachers are liars? They come seeking their own glory. That's what God told me. If a man preaches nothing but the positive, he's seeking his own glory. Akimaas, the big star. Well, then here comes the Kushite. He wasn't far behind him. He is a good runner. He comes in and he told the exact truth. Well, it didn't, you know, David had no connection with this man. He was just a courier. And he said, you won the war and Absalom is dead. Well, then David goes off on this thing. But this is what it's talking about here. Don't worry about people. All that Achimaaz did was cause confusion. He didn't do one thing. And I, I've kind of, I've, I just finished a book, The Mountains of Bashan. In fact, okay, Audrey, it's on the counter. It's ready to go. I proofread it again today. It's ready. So that should be out next week, hopefully, or two weeks. We get Tony here uh, moving on it fast and everything. Mark Overton will have it out in two weeks. The Mountains of Bashan. Boy, if there ever was a mountain of Bashan. And you know, that's the story of mankind. You've got your faithful messengers going along. And then you've got the rest of the world trying to be stars. And that's what the Lord is saying here. Be still. Be a Cushite. Be faithful. Do the job. Here's going to come the stars passing you up. King's favor. What does the Bible say? Do not fret when men succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. The world is full of Akimaats. The world is full of mountains of Bashan. And the world is going to go on like that. And let me tell you something. The religious realm and the secular realm are no different. The dynamics are the same. In fact, there is no secular and religious demarcation, but I'll just use it for communication. It actually, it only came about because of self-seeking of people. It's really no sacred and secular in the world. God's glory fills the whole earth. But in the world, you find people just doing their job. Maurice, just doing their job. You find other people that are blowing up the whole thing and messing everything up. And you find the same thing in the churches. For 2,000 years, we've got stars and then we got people that are just trusting in the Lord, doing good, faithfully doing what God called them to do. I admire that, Cushite. That's a lesson in that for me. Let's all be like that person, faithful, quiet of spirit, not seeking to be anything, not seeking to get anywhere, just waiting what the Lord tells us, do that, and then get back and read Shakespeare to the dog. Shall we stand? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We've had a good day, and I'm going to ask the elders now to bring in the communion, bring in the kids. We've had a good day. How many know we've had a good day in the house of the Lord?